help you? Yes. Um, my son-in-law called. He's been playing golf this morning. Uh -huh. uh -huh. 9.30. My daughter's been listening since this morning. She's eight months pregnant. She took her dog for a walk in the park. Mm -hmm. The dog came home with just the leash shot. And the dog came back without your daughter? Right. What concerns me the most is the fact that your dog came home with a leash on. That bothers me. No question. The big question now is, where is Scott Peterson? No one seems to know that answer. Neighbors haven't seen him in weeks. Meanwhile, at the time his wife Lacey disappeared, prosecutors say Scott was busy lying to his mistress, Amber Fry, telling her he was traveling during the holidays. Did you murder your wife? No, no. Uh, I just thought. And I had absolutely nothing to do with her disappearance. Um, and I know that uh, suspicion has turned to me. And it turned to me because of the inappropriate romantic um, that I had with Amber Fry then. Amber Fry went public about the romance after seeing all the stories about Lacey Peterson's disappearance. All, I met Scott Peterson November 20th, 2002. I was introduced to him. I was told he was unmarried. Were you in love with her? No. The police interviewed Scott Peterson three times, but after he got a lawyer, he did not talk to them again. His house was searched twice, and more questions about his behavior began to surface. Are you afraid police will arrest you? No. I know there is, there's no basis. I mean, I had nothing to do with their disappearance. So there, there's no uh, possible evidence or anything like that. This morning, a little bit before 12 o'clock, we got the report from a dog walker of a pretty badly decomposed body that had washed ashore. There was a mob gathered outside the downtown jail. Look at this. All the people who have gathered to catch a glimpse of Peterson as he was driven here from San Diego by detectives. He killed his wife and his baby. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I have no doubt about it. Yes, this man murdered Lacey Peterson. It was an explosive day for the prosecution, giving the defense a taste of their own medicine. The judge let the prosecution play by the rules Garagos was playing by. Lead prosecutor Rick DeStasso dropped a bombshell tip from a man claiming to be Scott Peterson's college friend. He said the two talked about how to get rid of a body. They would wrap the body in duct tape, wrap cement weights around the head and hands, throw it in the sea where the fish would eat away at the neck, leaving no identity on the body. Turns out, though, the tip was bogus, a red herring, yet the jury got to hear it anyway. Garagos was able to bring in tips uncorroborated, according to the prosecution, not good tips, while well, the prosecution got to do the same thing today. Rick DeStasso, for the first time, challenged Mark Garagos, and he won. He got in evidence in front of that jury that never should have been seen. Legal experts say DeStasso made a big point at the expense of the defense. For the first time, we get to see pictures of the evidence that included the baby's nursery that Scott Peterson decorated in a nautical theme. A cement acre in Peterson's boat, prosecutors believe he used to weigh down Lacey's body. And a picture of the yellow pages flipped open to a page listing local attorneys the day Lacey was reported missing. I also want to thank Sharon Rocha and her husband, Ron Gransky, for joining us today. They have laid to rest their daughter, Lacey, a beautiful young woman who was joyfully awaiting the arrival of a new son. They have also laid to rest that child, a boy named Connor, who was waiting to be born when his life, too, was taken. And his name is forever joined with that of his mom in this statue, which is also known as Lacey and Connor's Law. Outside court, Sharon Mocha was composed and greeted by some applause from court watchers. But in the courtroom, she unleashed a scathing attack on the man she used to consider a son. She called Scott Peterson a selfish, heartless, spoiled, self-centered coward. And it was when she became the voices of Lacey and Connor that many people in the courtroom began to cry. 
Quote, I hope this echoes through your head for all eternity. Lacey was thinking, Scott, why are you killing me? What are you doing? I loved you. I thought you loved me too. Scott, I want to live. I don't want to die. Scott's parents never heard Sharon speak. They left after shouting at the first speaker, Lacey's brother Brent Rocha, who told Scott that he was an arrogant, spoiled rich kid and a loser. Brent continued, quote, you are evil and still have the readiness to commit evil. I went to buy a gun. From the beginning, I knew you were guilty. I didn't kill you myself for one reason, so you'd have to sweat it out. As six members of Lacey's family took turns yelling at Scott, he showed no emotion aside from once shaking his head no. Probably the most infuriating things for the victims in this case is to have this killer still deny it to their face, take no responsibility. Of the original 18 jurors and alternates, 13 of them returned to court today as Judge Alfred DeLuke followed their verdict and sentenced Peterson to death. What the judge did today clearly, clearly says that we uh, we did the right thing and our work is uh, was was for the right. We, we did everything right. Our family's going to make make it. We're stronger because of this. And Scott got what he deserved. It seems like every single day, more and more explosive information is coming out about the new motion filed by Scott Peterson's new lawyers, who are with the Los Angeles Innocence Project. Now, I have taken the time to read through this new document, and I am absolutely floored by what I have read. So I'm going to take some time to actually sit down and go over the key sections of this new motion. It is a huge amount of information. So I'm just going to try to summarize the best I can to help you all understand why my mind is blown here. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Tara Marie and welcome to my channel, True Crime Matters, where we talk about and analyze everything true crime. For those of you who do know me, you know that I have covered the Scott Peterson case at some length and you know that I like to dig. I have put in the work of looking through the trial evidence and reading the court transcripts and let me tell you something. This case is extremely jam-packed with details that most people have never heard before since there are no video or audio recordings from trial. And let's face it, most people don't like to read. However, if one wants to really look at this evidence fairly, it is important to read the argument of both sides. And I'm the type of person who is obsessed with bringing text to life. In fact, very soon I'm going to be bringing to life some of the key portions of the transcripts so please stay tuned for that as well. For those of you who don't know anything about the Scott Peterson case, I highly suggest you go back and listen to my other Scott Peterson videos. But as always, I will give a brief overview of the case before I hop into the motion analysis. And for those of you who already know about the case, I will put the timestamps down below so you can skip forward to the motion analysis if you would like to. On Christmas Eve of 2002, an eight-month pregnant Lacey Peterson seemed to vanish from her home in Modesto, California, which turned into a national news story pretty much overnight. Her husband Scott's story was that he last saw Lacey mopping the kitchen floor as he left to go to his work warehouse that morning and then later went fishing that afternoon. Scott said that Lacey was watching the Martha Stewart show in the morning on TV, who was demonstrating how to make meringue. So, today, just tell me about the morning. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm not time got up. Uh, Lacey got up and went and um, skimmed pants and she had some show for breakfast. Each time she wakes up, otherwise she gets sick because she's pregnant. Um, I lay around the bed longer and I got up at 8 o'clock probably or so. Uh, showered. Um, we were watching her favorite show, Martha Stewart. Watched a little bit of that. You didn't watch the whole thing though? No. 
you remember what part you saw? I mean, I don't know which of them. It could be the old title. Okay. Because he's a sub story that talk about what to do with Rorang. So what are we going to do with all the egg white story? Ooh, you want to make little meringues? Oh, that would be nice. Mm-hmm. Scott also said that Lacey mentioned that she was going to finish mopping the floor since their cats and golden retriever Mackenzie kept tracking mud throughout the kitchen and around the house from the backyard. And obviously she did a lot of work, but the house was filthy. Why was your wife mopping on Tuesday morning? Yeah, I mean, she was pretty fastidious about it, though. Was she? With the dog and the cats and her, uh, you know, doing the Christmas deal. That was, that was pretty common. Was that going to be at your house? Or, or today, right? Yeah. It is. Okay. He also said that Lacey mentioned she wanted to go grocery shopping and then bake in the afternoon. So what she was going to do for the day. And... Okay, so um, she told you what she was going to do. Yeah. And what was that? Um, she's going to finish cleaning up, like I said, she's going to put that dish for her. Uh, take the dog for a walk, and then she's going to the store to buy for Christmas morning breakfast tour. And that was going to be a, a ball prep. So that was her afternoon was prepping for breakfast. She's going to make gingerbread cookies for tonight. Scott said that him and Lacey had discussed that around 4 p.m. they would start getting ready to go over to her parents' house for Christmas Eve dinner, which was about five to ten minutes away from their home. Scott says that it was a morning decision to decide whether to go golfing or fishing that day, and he had said it seemed too cold to go golfing, so then he decided to go fishing instead. Well, oh, that was a morning decision. It's a, it was a morning so I played golf club or location. Okay. Seemed too cold to go to the club, so um, yeah, just decided to, you know, buy a therapy or that. Mm-hmm. Now, just a side note that Scott was an extremely talented golf player. He was almost professional level. I am not a sports fan at all, definitely not a golf fan, but It's been explained to me that people don't typically go golfing when it's cold outside because of the need to wear heavier, bigger, bulkier clothing, and that can tend to affect your swing. Plus, also if it's windy at all, obviously that would affect the ball and the game. So later, a lot of people were confused why Scott would name being too cold outside to go fishing instead of golfing? Isn't it colder on the water? I think a lot of people don't understand that it had to do with the actual game of golf itself. Scott said he left the home sometime around 9.35 and drove about 10 minutes away to his work warehouse. Okay, so then about 9.30 you left. And you drove your four-door truck. Uh, and you went over to your shop. Right. What did you do over there? Uh, I assembled my uh, mortiser, and the mortiser is a woodworking tool, make tables. Uh, I think you saw it on the uh, trailer there. Uh, Yay big. Yeah. Yeah, I just got that, so I assembled it. Uh, Check my email. Sent one email. Then hook the boat up. Then Scott head off to the San Francisco Bay, which was about a 90 minute drive from the Modesto area where he lived. Now, a lot of people point out how odd it was that a man would leave his pregnant wife alone on Christmas Eve as he went fishing 90 minutes away instead of somewhere closer. But it's also important to kind of point out the fact that Scott was a salesman, so he was on the road for his job and he would travel very great distances all week long and this was something that Lacey was used to. It was absolutely nothing out of the ordinary for him to take a long drive somewhere, even in Mexico in some cases. And they both knew that Lacey's family lived less than 10 minutes away in case Lacey needed help. Plus, Scott and Lacey had just went to an ultrasound the day prior 
And everything was measuring, you know, right on point for the baby. There was no expectation that the baby would be born early whatsoever. Now, Scott would say that he went to San Francisco Bay pretty much just to get his new boat in the water. He had never used it before. He didn't know how it was going to perform in salt water. He had literally just purchased the boat a few weeks before. So it was just all a test just to sort of get it in the water. Control, a bit. Like a lot of, a lot of the reason I went was just to get that boat in the water to see, you know, if you can. Amy, what's going on? Thanks, Amy. Also, part of Scott's story was that since it was a new boat and he had never handled kind of getting it in the water before, he really struggled to even, you know, get it in the water. He was having issues backing up, you know, uh, trying to get close to the water. And he said a lot of onlookers were getting a really good laugh at how bad he was at it. The guys working, fixing, uh, maintenance guys got a good laugh at me trying to back down the trailer. But he said ultimately he finally got it in the water and headed out to scope out Brooks Island. But he said once he got there, there was really not a lot to see there. Um, he trolled for a bit, but really started to head back inland when it started to drizzle. Plus, he said it was already starting to get late, and he knew that he was supposed to be back home with Lacey by 4 p.m. So the story goes that the night before all of this, Scott and Lacey were getting their hair cut by Lacey's sister. And during those haircuts, Scott had volunteered to pick up this holiday gift basket from a farmer's market, which happened to be like really close to the golf course that he thought he may go golfing at that day. It was supposed to be a gift for Lacey's family. So Scott initially actually volunteered to get like this farmer's gift basket and because he figured he would just grab it right after golfing. But as he was driving home and sort of hitting this holiday traffic back home to Modesto, he realized that he would not get to that farmer's market before it closed. So Scott immediately called Lacey around 2.15 and left this now infamous message. Hey beautiful, I just left a message at home. Uh, 2.15, I live in Berkeley. I won't be able to get to the Villa Farms to get that basket for Papa. I was hoping you would get this message and uh, go on out there. I'll see you in a bit. We love you. Bye. And this message. Now, one thing I wanted to add in here that truly isn't widely reported at all, I never hear it talked about, is the fact that Lacey's cell phone wasn't really working. 20 years ago, phones weren't as well made as they are now, and they weren't even used as much as they're used now. People who had phones 20 years ago might remember how expensive they were, so you still kind of tried to use landlines whenever you can. So Lacey would use the cell phone and keep it in her car for emergencies, and she would kind of keep it plugged in into her cigarette lighter, but it really wouldn't turn on all that well or at all. So when police discovered her phone in her car, it wouldn't even turn on for them either. So Scott continued to drive home, but was hitting more holiday traffic. So he tried calling Lacey again on the landline at 3.52 p.m., but she still did not answer. And this time he did not leave a message and he just hoped that she had picked up the basket by this time because it was already too late now for him to grab the basket. So Scott returned the boat to his warehouse and then headed back home. And he said when he returned home around 4.35, he noticed one particularly odd thing that he initially brushed off, but he would recollect later down the road. The family dog Mackenzie was sitting in the backyard with his leash still attached. Okay, then you got home, then when, how'd you go, what door did you go in? Went in the, what I would call her back door, which is the French door where my shoes were at. She had all out there? Yeah. 
Yeah. And did he still have his leash on? He said he noticed right away that all the lights were off and Lacey was not home, but he said he immediately assumed since he had walked in late that Lacey's parents picked her up already. So Scott said he was starving from the whole day of not eating, so he grabbed a slice of cold pizza from the fridge, a glass of milk, took all of his stinky, wet fishing clothes off, threw them in the wash, went to take a shower, and he said when he was heading out of the shower, after he got dressed, he noticed the blinking answering machine, so he wanted to check it really quick. He said the first message that he heard was his own message to Lacey, but then he was taken back when he heard the next message, and the message was from Lacey's mother's boyfriend, Ron. And he was asking for Lacey and Scott to bring over some whipped cream for dessert. This prompted Scott to immediately call Lacey's mother's home. Scott first asked if Lacey was there, but Lacey's mother replied, of course not. You guys are supposed to come over together. Okay, so then you called over once? That's right. Had they heard from her? No. Okay, so you told Sharon or did you talk to Ron? Talked to, um, talked to Ron for Sharon. And when, when I asked if Lacey was there, he told me no. That was really the first time he was puzzled because he had immediately assumed that Lacey was at her parents' house. Scott then told Sharon that Lacey's car was in the driveway, but that Lacey wasn't home. Sharon then asked, well, is Mackenzie there? Maybe she took Mackenzie for a walk. And Scott said, yeah, she did say she was gonna take Mackenzie for a walk. But when I came home, Mackenzie's leash was still on in the backyard. Sharon and, you know, Scott kind of go back and forth trying to think what could have happened, where she could be, maybe something happened in the park. This is what began the huge search for Lacey. Lacey's mom, Sharon, instructed Scott, call Lacey's friends, call her right back after that, but they were going to call 911. So they hung up. Ron Gransky, who again is Lacey's stepfather, immediately called 911. And then Scott began calling Lacey's friends. What, who else did you call other people then? I called Sharon, um, and then I called a couple of Lacey's uh, closer friends, I think Stacy and Renee, um, and that was, I had the phone book out to call hospitals when I think Sharon called me back at that point and said that they would do that and call the police and for me to uh, check the neighbors and go to the park. The neighbors would describe a very distraught Scott, asking if they had seen Lacey at all any time that day. And some people in the neighborhood would later report that they actually had seen Lacey walking the dog that morning, which would have been after Scott left for the day. Now, after Ron called 911, Scott and Lacey's mother, Sharon, agreed to meet at the neighborhood park called Dry Creek Park, where Lacey would sometimes walk Mackenzie. But it's also not widely reported that Scott too called the police from his cell phone when he was at the park. Not only was he the first person who raised a red flag about something being wrong by calling her parents, but he actually did call the police. It was only because Sharon took on that responsibility and recommended he call her friends that Scott didn't initially call police. When domestic partners are responsible for the death of their mate, they typically don't report it to anyone, let alone the police. In fact, more often they kind of tried to play it off like 
maybe there was some kind of dispute and the person ran off in anger or with like somebody they were having an affair with. Kind of like what Chris Watts did, if you remember. He tried to make it look like Shanann ran off with the girls and it was only, you know, her really good friend who was worried about her whereabouts who actually called the police. As Scott met with Lacey's mother at the park as they had agreed to do, police would already begin to descend on the Peterson home. So by the time Scott left the park in his search for Lacey, the police were already in his home. Now, initially, Lacey's family and friends would maintain that there was absolutely no way Scott would ever have anything to do with Lacey's disappearance. Scott has been described by ex-girlfriends, teachers, and coaches as being sort of like beyond patient. And one ex-girlfriend even said that she had to dump Scott because he wound up being like too much of a boring homebody and he was like overly romantic and like sweet. All of Lacey's friends would also say that there was never any sort of any DV issues whatsoever and that Scott was extremely patient and soft-spoken with Lacey, who was a very uh, headstrong type woman. She just, uh, Lacey loves life, she loves people. She loves entertaining, she's happy, she's... She and Scott are just so much in love, they just, they're just, I think everybody envies their relationship. They're just perfect together. They have a wonderful life. They're looking forward to having their baby. They've waited a long time. They've tried for a long time to have a baby and she finally became pregnant and, and this is just the center of her world, is to have her baby and be with her husband. Thought about anyone she knew or or anyone in her life that may have wanted wrong for her. No, no. You come up with nobody. Me? Everybody liked Lacey. I mean, she's the kind of person that smile and talk to anybody. Are you disappointed by the suspicion of course mm -hmm. I am. <laughs> Absolutely. In fact, the biggest lead initially in Lacey's disappearance was the fact that the very same morning Lacey had gone missing. The neighbors who lived directly across the street, a few hundred feet away, had been burglarized. Now, this neighborhood of Modesto, California, actually had its fair share of crime. There was a pretty bad transient issue to the point where Lacey had actually written a few letters to the township asking for more lighting in the park for safety, among other things. And it was actually reported that while Lacey was pregnant, she was seen, you know, breaking up a fight between transients in the middle of the street. So even though she was pregnant, she was still this, you know, kind of fearless, um, powerful, strong woman, which is amazing of her. Anyway, when the police caught these burglars later, these criminals would claim that they did not burglarize the home the same day Lacey went missing and they knew nothing about the missing lady. Instead, they told police they burglarized the home on the 26th, citing that they knew that nobody was home because there was a lot of mail sticking out of the mailbox. However, oddly enough, both a woman who had reported witnessing the burglary and a local news reporter maintain that they are certain there is no way the burglary occurred on December 26th. The news reporter said he knew this because he was standing outside that home the morning of the 26th after Lacey went missing. He was reporting almost constantly over there. And even in a declaration by the homeowners who were burglarized, they maintained that they believed that this burglary occurred on the 24th because even they said when they tried to get on the street on the 26th, even they had to show their IDs to get down the street. And that's not all, not by a long shot, because I'm about to dive into the new motion that will show witness after witness who lived in Scott and Lacey's neighborhood that were ignored by the Modesto Police Department. In a recent documentary on the case, it was even revealed that one of the lead detectives in the case didn't even follow up on the tip from the neighbor who claims she witnessed the strange men in the same time frame Lacey went missing. Also, one thing I always found odd is that 
The description that Diane Jackson gave does not match the description of the two men that were arrested for it. So it is possible that this is kind of an organized crime situation or even just more people were involved in the burglary and it, they just were not caught or questioned by police. Despite Lacey's family and friends being supportive of Scott, investigators really had a gut feeling that Scott had everything to do with his wife's disappearance. They said that he was just too calm, too stoic for him to really be innocent. So police kept digging deeper and deeper on Scott. Police were even so negligent to actually report Scott's alibi on national television pretty immediately in the investigation, which is something that police are not supposed to be doing. During the day before Christmas, her husband was fishing in the Bay Area. Now this opened up a huge window of opportunity for an innocent person to be framed or for people to think that there's a possibility that he didn't do it. It kind of opens up this whole can of worms. But despite all of their searching, police really didn't have any solid forensic evidence at all against Scott. He seemed to be telling much of the truth, as the police would later admit on the stand. His timeline checked out, police scanned all of his computers, his cell phones, and used luminol on every square inch of Scott's boat, car, home, the mop found in the kitchen and his clothes from the boating trip. There were no signs of blood or human waste at all on the mattress, which is something that happens. Sadly, when people are killed, they do kind of, you know, release whatever's in their bladder or, you know, wherever else, especially pregnant women. So it was very puzzling that they found absolutely nothing anywhere. The only piece of forensic evidence in the entire case was a single hair that was found in a pair of pliers in Scott's boat. And it was said to be consistent with the type of hair Lacey had. It wasn't even proven to be 100% her DNA. The hair, I believe, was found nearly two months into the investigation on the boat. Transferred DNA, such as a single hair from someone Scott lived with on a daily basis, found on something that actually wasn't really proven to be a murder weapon or in any way connected to the actual murder, so it doesn't really connect any dots. This wasn't like the Doomsday Moms case, the, the Lori Vallow Daybell case, where Lori's hair was actually found on a piece of duct tape that was wrapped around her son JJ's body. But let's imagine for a second that hair is proof that Scott did something with Lacey on the boat with the pliers. That still doesn't add up either. Police theorized that Scott had wrapped up her body before the boat, and that's why there was no traces of DNA in the bed of his truck, inside the toolbox of his truck, or anywhere inside the boat, except for this random hair in the hinge of the pliers. In some instances, it almost looks like they may have been so laser focused on Scott that they completely ignored evidence that didn't fit the narrative that Scott did it. The biggest clue that something else may have happened to Lacey actually came from a correctional lieutenant. His name is Lieutenant Aponte, and he worked at the investigations unit at the California Rehabilitation Institute at Norco. And it was his job to listen in on phone calls between inmates and whoever else they were calling. Well, a few weeks after Lacey's disappearance, Lieutenant Aponte heard something very unsettling. That was information between an inmate that didn't realize he was being recorded and the inmate's brother on the other end of the call. Lieutenant Aponte immediately called the Modesto Police Department to report this tip that not only had he overheard the phone conversation, but he had in his possession a copy of the phone conversation between an inmate and his brother discussing a confrontation between one of the burglars and Lacey Peterson the morning she went missing. Now, while the tip from this Lieutenant Aponte can be seen within the police notes, the Modesto police claim they have no memory of a meeting, despite Lieutenant Aponte claiming he did have an in-person meeting with the detective. As if that's not bizarre enough, the tape that Lieutenant Aponte gave the police is also missing. Even weirder than that, the recording system for the prison itself was 
soon afterwards changed entirely. Thus, all recordings were deleted for good. Now, this lieutenant had maintained that an inmate named Sean Tenbrink was this inmate who placed the call to his brother Adam. One of those who would be charged with the burglary did indeed know this inmate, Sean Tenbrink. In fact, they all lived in or very close to Scott and Lacey's neighborhood in Modesto. All of them had criminal records and they were known to associate with each other. In addition to that puzzling tip, more than 12 witnesses from the neighborhood claimed to have seen Lacey walking in the neighborhood that morning or had seen the dog Mackenzie running loose in the park. Despite that, police remained laser focused on Scott until they finally got what they saw as a huge break in the case when a young woman named Amber Fry called the police station multiple times, by the way, she couldn't get through, but she claimed she was having an affair with Scott for the past few weeks. She told the police that Scott had told her he wasn't married and that he had lost his wife. Once police found this out, they immediately brought this evidence to Lacey's family to show them this proof that the son-in-law they had trusted up to this point likely had something to do with their daughter's disappearance. The other thing that the police brought up, in addition to that uh, information immediately in the same discussion with Lacey's family, was the fact that they said that Scott had purchased life insurance against Lacey as well. So it was kind of like a two-part, double whammy piece of information they were giving the family. And later at trial, it was actually revealed that it was her suggestion because one of their friends were selling life insurance. It was something they were kind of using to get Lacey's family to turn against Scott to hopefully get more information out of him that way. So it was really after this point that Lacey's family completely turned on Scott and began to look at him a lot differently. It was at this point at the request of the police that Amber began recording her phone conversations with Scott that the police would use as evidence against him. Sadly, on April 13th, 2003, a couple walking their dog in Richmond's Point Isabel Regional Shoreline Park discovered the remains of a full-term male newborn in a marshy part of the San Francisco Bay Beach. And just one day later, one mile from the location of where the baby was found, another woman walking her dogs realized her dogs had found a corpse almost unrecognizable as a human body. Then on April 18th, DNA results verified that the bodies found were indeed of Lacey Peterson and her unborn son. Police immediately descended upon Scott and arrested him outside a golf club that he was meeting his father and brother at to play golf the same day. I found out that Scott had been arrested at the golf course, and that was a real shocking development, of course. Scott's trial began on June 1, 2004, and it went on for almost six months. The jury deliberated for seven full days, so not a quick deliberation at all. In fact, during those deliberations, there were all kinds of juror issues. One juror was removed and replaced due to misconduct, while the foreman, who was an attorney and a doctor, requested his own removal because he told the judge he was being threatened to be beaten to a pulp because he kept insisting that the jury go back and look at his extensive notes. It has been long said that this foreman was leaning heavily not guilty, citing lack of evidence, but several jurors were unwilling to listen to him to go back and want to discuss the case more. On November 12th, the jury convicted Scott of two counts of murder, first degree murder with special circumstances for killing Lacey, and second-degree murder for killing Connor. 
Then on December 13th, the jury sentenced Scott to death. Over the years, Scott has filed several different appeals. He appealed his death sentence quite a few times until he finally was victorious. On August 24, 2020, in a 7-0 decision, the Supreme Court of California upheld Scott's conviction but overturned his death sentence because the court found that Scott's trial judge, Judge DeLucci, had improperly dismissed jurors who opposed capital punishment without asking them whether they could put their views aside. Justice Leandra Kruger explained that, per Supreme Court rulings since 1968, jurors may not be excused merely for opposition to the death penalty, but only for views rendering them unable to fairly consider imposing that penalty in accordance with their oath. She added that this was the meaning of the guarantee of an impartial jury. Scott also filed a habeas petition, which included new evidence that a juror had lied on her jury application several times to get on the jury. This was a very high profile case. It was all over the media and a lot of people were interested on in being on the jury solely for the potential to maybe make money with interviews and book deals. But Anyway, Scott argued that juror number seven, Rochelle Nice, did have a history with experiencing DV while she was pregnant nonetheless, and she was involved in a lawsuit. I'll just take a moment. Manriquez was a relatively recent 2018 decision of the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court talked about how a, quote, a juror who conceals relevant facts or gives false answers during the voir dire examination undermines jury selection and commits misconduct. And then they went on to say, such misconduct includes the unintentional concealment, that is, the inadvertent non-disclosure of facts. But let's say, for example, a juror gives a false answer and it's unintentional. We know from Boyette, we know from Enriquez, and we know from Cowan that that's still misconduct. That's why each of those cases found unintentional false answers, but they went on to uh, impose a presumption of correctness, a presumption of prejudice, and they resolved the case by analyzing whether, in fact, the state had rebutted the presumption. Question 54 was the question that asked, uh, have you ever been involved in a lawsuit? And Ms. Nice answered in the questionnaire, no, I haven't. And in fact, we now know that that was false, that she was involved in two lawsuits, a restraining order lawsuit in 2000 and a civil damages lawsuit uh, sometime thereafter. <clears throat> How do we know? We know because Ms. Nice has told us. Exhibit one of the, of the exhibits that were introduced, Your Honor, is the paperwork for the restraining order litigation in November of 2000 and December of 2000. The other question I'd like to cover in terms of the jury misconduct burden, Your Honor, uh, is question 74. That was the question that asks, have you or any close friends or any relatives been the victim or witness of a crime? She, Kinsey, kicked in the front door of your house. Is that correct? Answer, she did. Question, did you consider that to be a crime? Answer, yeah, sure. So it, it was a crime, and it was a crime against her, uh, and she's admitted it. And yet, uh, in the questionnaire, when asked, have you ever been the victim of a crime, she said no. The question is, is, is she the victim of a stalking? And I think, again, Ms. Nice has told us that she was. Uh, and this is, at, at, I think, page 57 of the transcript. Do you consider her stalking you to be a crime? Answer, sure. So we can debate it, but Ms. Nice didn't debate it. She was the victim of stalking. So on November 2nd, 2001, police arrived at Ms. Uh, nice's house late in the evening. Mr. Whiteside is arrested and charged with five crimes. He's charged with battery on a spouse, corporal injury to a spouse, false imprisonment, endangering the health uh, of a child, cruelty to a child, and simple battery. We know from the remaining exhibits that, in fact, uh, he pleads guilty. He pleads guilty to battery, and the other charges are dismissed. And we know he's ordered to serve, I think, uh, 10 days in county and 104 hours of domestic violence counseling. Side note, Miss Nice also checked off in her jury questionnaire that she would not be able to judge this case fairly and that she would not be able to put aside everything she heard in the media. But that was actually outside of Scott's argument, since his initial lawyers should have really caught that and not allowed her on the jury. Okay, so let me go back to the jury questionnaire 97A. 
Um, I'm sorry, Your Honor, I don't have 97. That's all right. I'll read it to you. Oh, thanks. The jurors that sit on this case will be instructed that they must base their decision entirely on the evidence produced in court, comma, not from any outside or pre-existing opinion or attitudes. Can you do that despite what you have read, heard, or seen about this case? She checked no. She did. Any follow-up on that from Mr. Garagos? I, I don't recall. I assume the parties thought it was a mistake, uh, but I don't know. It seems uh, astonishing to me, Your Honor. It seems uh, absolutely consistent with the idea that she had some kind of predetermined uh, bias in the case, and she was talking about it there, but I don't believe there's any follow-up on it. Well, but isn't that pretty important to follow up? I, I, the whole reason for these questionnaires is for the attorneys to look at answers carefully and follow up and say, you know, I noticed you've given all these answers right now, but I noticed on 97A, you checked no. Miss Nice, or juror number seven at the time. Yes. Was that a mistake? Can you explain? Isn't that what attorneys are supposed to do? I agree, I completely, Your Honor. Okay, all right. I was, I was not there, Your Honor, but I, I agree completely with your assessment. Okay. okay. On December 20th, 2022, Judge Mazzullo denied Scott's habeas petition. She said that while she agreed that Mrs. Nice's responses were not accurate, she didn't believe there was enough evidence to prove that Nice intentionally lied. She wrote, the court concludes that juror number seven's responses were not motivated by pre-existing or improper bias against Scott but instead were the result of a combination of good faith misunderstanding of the questions and sloppiness in answering. Scott still had the legal option of appealing her ruling. Instead, Scott tried a new route, apparently because his discovery team stumbled on new evidence. So what is that new evidence? Well, buckle up folks, because here's where things start to get crazy. Last spring, on April 27, 2023, the Scott Peterson Appeal Facebook group revealed that there was new evidence to support the claim that the Medina burglary that occurred across the street from the Petersons' home did happen in the same exact time frame that Lacey went missing, and that it did definitely have something to do with her disappearance. The claim was that two separate witnesses had recently heard a man admit that he participated in the Medina burglary and that Lacey caught them in the act. These witnesses had signed declarations and were apparently willing to testify, something that many witnesses in this case have been afraid to do because of the high profile nature of the case and because so many people who get involved in this case receive death threats. The appeal page continued that these new witnesses' names were under seal with the court and that they signed declarations that they are absolutely telling the truth. Here's what was written on the appeal page last spring. Evidence has always indicated that Lacey was alive when Scott left home in the morning of December 24, 2002. The evidence shows that Lacey woke up, she put her pajamas in the hamper, she got dressed, she used the computer, she curled her hair, she watched Martha Stewart, she mopped the floor, she leashed up the dog Mackenzie, and she went back into the house, perhaps to use the restroom or grab a jacket. She walked the dog, and the evidence has long suggested that Lacey witnessed or confronted burglars that were burglarizing the Medina home directly across the street from her home. This is no longer a suggestion, and this new evidence is admissible in court. These new witnesses have provided specific details they recently heard from a man who admitted to participating in the Medina burglary on December 24, 2002. He admitted that Lacey caught them while they were removing a safe from the house and that she threatened to call the police. He said they, quote, couldn't afford to get caught, so they had to shut her up. He admitted that they took Lacey and that the men he was with killed her. He admitted that they saw on television that Scott said he had gone fishing in the Bay Area, so they took her body there. 
He gave details that have never been made public that confirm his story to be true. While we've always known Scott to be innocent, nothing could prepare us for the heartbreak and emotions we felt when there was finally a name and specific details attached to what happened to Lacey and Connor. We find ourselves devastated about what her last days must have been like, and we find ourselves mourning their loss all over again. While our judicial system is based on the assumption of innocence until proven guilty, the burden has now shifted and Scott must now prove his innocence. We would argue that Scott was never granted his constitutional right to be presumed innocent and was never proven to be guilty and was instead tried from the very beginning with the burden that he must prove who else could have done this. This newly discovered evidence not only proves that Scott is innocent, but it answers in part who is responsible for Lacey's kidnapping and murder. Our investigation is not over. There is still more to come. This evidence has been filed with the court and we will post more information in the coming days. Now, if you do watch my channel, you know that I did report on that appeal document pretty soon after it was submitted with the court and we discussed what all of those claims in the document were. And I will tell you that ever since April, I have been logging into the California First Appellate District website to check constantly if there was an update to the docket to see if anything new was showing. And I have to say that my interest was really piqued when I saw later in 2003 that Scott was going to be represented by a female attorney named Corrine Ferentino. Two months before this whole Innocence Project news broke, I noticed that there was suddenly a substitution of attorneys. Initially, I was thinking that maybe Corrine like saw the details of the case and she felt she couldn't in good conscience take the case on or something. So I was a little confused and my interest was piqued at that. But then I saw a new name. It said Paula Mitchell. So me loving to dig, I figured out and reported three months ago that Paula Mitchell is indeed with the LA Innocence Project. And I recall being kind of stunned because I kept looking and no news outlets were reporting anything about this. So, of course, I go on vacation last week and then this whole case kind of explodes again in the media. But anyway, now I'm back from vacation. It's been reported that either Scott and or his lawyers submitted all of this groundbreaking new evidence they claim and then sent it off to the LA Innocence Project, probably about the same time they filed the new habeas corpus. There seemed to be some real legitimate new evidence stuff here. And just last week, the motion that the Innocence Project has filed, about 400 pages long, has been made public. Now, I will finally give some insight of what is in that document. I've read it so far, and again, it's frankly shocking. I mean, this motion begins with a statement that based on the council's review of the record and evidence in this case, there is good cause to believe the discovery sought by way of this motion has not been previously provided to the defense, or if it was, it no longer is found in the trial files provided to counsel. The court should grant this motion and the motion for DNA testing filed within. So further investigation can be conducted and Mr. Peterson can develop the evidence needed to support his claim of innocence. It says it must be turned over, not solely information that is in the hands of the prosecutor. To obtain post-conviction discovery beyond file reconstruction, the defendant must show a reasonable basis to believe that the specific materials they seek actually existed. Mr. Peterson, by and through his counsel, has made good faith efforts to obtain the items requested in this motion, included before, during, and after his trial, but has been unsuccessful. And here is what they are requesting. Discovery requested. The discovery Mr. Peterson seeks by way of this motion generally falls into the following categories. A, the Medina burglary, investigation reports. B, Lieutenant Xavier Aponte, reports and recordings of the Medina burglary. C, Lacey Peterson's missing croton watch and pawn shop investigation. 
D, incendiary van fire in airport district the morning of December 25, 2002. E, witnesses who reported seeing Lacey Peterson on or after December 24th. F, eyewitnesses who reported seeing the Peterson's dog alone and unattended. G, missing Bates pages. H, Jean Ralston reports videos and other data related to Bay searches. I, all reports, videos, and other data related to Bay searches. J, computer forensics evidence related to time Mr. Peterson arrived at his office. K, scent dog reports, including water cadaver dogs employed in Bay searches. L, MPD and SCD policies governing disclosure of conflicts of interest. M, new reports and leads. N, audio and video recordings of NPD interviews with Scott Peterson. O, the Tracy tip. P, current evidence, property, and chain of custody logs for all evidence items. So that is the list. And let's start with section A, the Medina burglary. Scott's team is requesting a complete copy of the Modesto Police Department's investigation into the burglary of the Medina's home at 516 Covina Avenue. Again, pretty early on in the investigation, details emerge that there was a burglary that occurred literally across the street from the Petersons' home in the same general time frame that Lacey went missing. What are the odds of two incidents of criminal activity happening within the same, I don't know, thousand feet of each other on the same day by two different parties? I'm not sure what those odds are, but to me, it seems much more likely that they probably were related. However, police decided early on the burglary hadn't occurred the same time frame, and they decided that pretty quickly. In this motion, it says they caught the burglars because an anonymous informant came forward, quote, out of concern for Lacey, and named four men, only two of which were arrested, Stephen Todd and Glenn Pierce. Now, police say they interrogated these two burglars, and their story was they committed the burglary on the 26th, despite several eyewitnesses reporting they had seen a van and apparent burglary in action around 11 a.m. on Christmas Eve, the day that Lacey went missing. They said they were scouring the neighborhood and they noticed that the neighbor's home sure had a lot of mail sticking out of the mailbox. Therefore, they assumed that the owners, the Medinas, were on vacation. The police said they followed up on some clues and ultimately said they determined that the burglary had nothing to do with the disappearance of Lacey and deemed that it occurred on the 26th. There was also multiple eyewitnesses who immediately reported to police they had seen both white and rust-colored suspicious vans between two and four suspicious men and all these witnesses were sure this happened on Christmas Eve. It's kind of a memorable day to most people they have a lot of commitments that day and a lot of places to be and frankly it's not really like any other day of the year for many this new motion includes even more mind-blowing evidence regarding the burglary and information on the burglars the ones that stand out to me the most are these first of all the la innocence project i.e scott's lawyers are requesting the Modesto Police Department's reports, notes, or other methods documenting Stephen Todd's substance, M-E-T-H, use on December 24th through 26th, which would have compromised his ability to recall dates and times or events that week. His lawyers cite the reason for believing these documents exist because in a post-conviction interview, Todd admitted that he was so, quote, high on C-R-A-C-K and M-E-T-H during the week of December 24th to 26th that he didn't really remember anything he did during that period. The motion also cites new evidence that individuals in addition to Todd and Pierce were involved in burglarizing the Medina's home and that the burglary was carried out over the course of a few days. So properly seized from any of the above reference locations may yield evidence of others involved in the Medina burglary who may have encountered Lacey Peterson on December 24th. Now, 
Remember that over the summer, the Scott Peterson appeal page said that there was some new evidence that came to them by a person or multiple people who had knowledge about details surrounding the case that were not made public? Well, this section about the burglary, there is a footnote that a signed declaration by a person or persons with knowledge attesting to the fact that the police recovered the Medina's money wrappers. Not sure how they knew about that specific information, but we may soon find out. Also, Scott's lawyers are requesting all evidence related to the gun and jewelry anonymously dropped off at the Modesto Police Department on January 2nd, 2003, including but not limited to videotaped surveillance footage from the Modesto Police Department lobby taken approximately 1.10 a.m. on January 3rd, 2003, depicting a white male adult, late 20s to 30s, five foot eight inches tall, approximately 150 pounds, coming into the lobby carrying a blue plastic shopping bag and telling the officer in the call box that he wanted to turn over some stolen property, which was later determined to be jewelry and a gun from the Medina burglary. Now, when I first read that, my immediate thought was, they wanted to return stuff so that they weren't like connected to the disappearance of Lacey, right? Like, who would want to be caught with that stuff? Because obviously burgl burglars don't really like, you know, give back stuff they steal. So why would they care so much to return these items if they had nothing to do with Lacey's disappearance? Something we already knew from previous discussions about the burglary was specific testimony from Diane Jackson, the neighbor who has maintained for over 20 years. She saw a van with three dark-skinned men located on the street outside the Medina and Peterson's home. But what I never knew is that the wife of a former Modesto Police Department detective named Nick Chiles, who worked with Detective Rochini, had reported that around 9.30 a.m. on December 24th, 2002, she too saw three suspicious men. Suspect one was white, middle-aged, 30s to 40s, five foot 11 inches tall, shoulder length brown greasy hair, mustache, dark quilt type jacket. Suspect two, white middle-aged male, 30 to 40, balding, medium build flannel shirt. And suspect three, she said she did not see well. And a van parked outside the Medina residence. And the men, acted suspicious. It also says in this motion, the fact that again, this wife of this police detective called and tried several times to report this. It says here that Miss Chili's says, she specifically reached out to a certain detective to report that she believed she had possible material information about the disappearance of Lacey Peterson. And again, in the footnote of this motion, it reads that Scott's team has a sworn declaration by a person or persons with knowledge attesting to the fact that Miss Chili's attempted at least twice to report the information about the van and detailed descriptions of the suspicious men she had seen on Convenia Avenue on December 24th, 2002. And there's just like way more witnesses here. Someone named Ninev T, it's redacted, saw three Hispanic males, 20s to 30s, standing near an older 1975 to 1980 van, white, full-sized, no windows, possibly a Chevy van parked on the east side of Covina in the afternoon of December 24th, 2002. And this pretty much matches exactly what Diane Jackson's description was to a T. There's a witness here named Sean M indicating that around 3.30 p.m. on December 24, 2002, he saw men wearing stocking caps and sunglasses driving an older 70s van that drove past his home in the Loloma neighborhood, which is right near the Peterson's home, multiple times. And he saw the men looking into windows of homes like they were going to look for homes to burglarize, including, but not limited to any attempted identification of the van he observed. Kim V told police on January 1st, 2003, that she saw an older, quote, two-toned beige van associated with three Hispanic men who frequently sold what appeared to her to be stolen goods from their van 
at the corner of Yosemite Boulevard and Santa Fe Avenue, roughly two miles from the Petersons' home. Miss V further reported that she too had been the victim of a burglary on December 21st, 2002, and that she suspected the van she described seeing may have been involved in Lacey's disappearance. And the van she had seen at that corner stopped showing up soon thereafter. And once again, Scott's team is requesting that Scott finally be provided with all of these reports he has never been provided. In fact, the team is also requesting that he be given all notes from all the confidential informants who are referenced in the notes of an officer, Helton, Detective Stowe and Cloward, and Agent Brody's reports. And this is where things get pretty wild. Scott's team is really pressing to know the criminal history of these informants, specifically someone named Ralph G. Now, in the footnote here, it says, while Ralph G is not named in any Modesto Police Department reports, he has been identified by others as informant referred to as Mr. X, who provided police with information on January 2nd, 2003, about who was responsible for the burglary of the Medina's home. They also have a sworn declaration by a person or persons with knowledge attesting to the fact he called in a report to the MPD about Todd and Pierce's involvement. So who the heck is this Ralph G dude? And what does he know is my question. So obviously Scott's lawyers are requesting all notes, interviews, recordings, and or any documents related to that. Something else I didn't read anywhere else is this really bizarre um, piece of information right here. The lawyers for Scott are requesting all reports, notes, interviews, and recordings related to information provided to MPD by the teacher of Stephen Todd's son, including statements that the mother of Stephen Todd's child had a history of selling babies in open adoptions and indications from Stephen Todd's son about violent acts on a pregnant woman and any subsequent investigation based on the information provided. And as I read further in the footnotes, there was a comment that there is a sworn declaration by a person or persons who stated in a post-conviction interview conducted in 2010 that after providing the above described information to MPD, she also had an incident with Stephen Todd's four-year-old son on the playground in which he made a cutting motion across his chest and stomach and made a statement to her about Lacey Peterson and the baby cut out. She further indicated that Stephen Todd's son talked about how his father had a fondest for knives. Fearing violent retaliation from the Todd family, whom this witness regarded as, quote, dangerous, the witness asked that post-conviction interview that her name not be included in any public filings. Also, one of the biggest things that really stuck out to me as evidence that this burglary probably did happen on the 24th, I mean, aside from all of the eyewitnesses, was something I just read the other day within this motion. It actually comes up later in the motion. And it was a statement from Scott and Lacey's neighbor, the Medinas who were the ones burglarized. She had placed outgoing mail in their mailbox that could be really seen sticking out. She worked from home and she had some documents that she wanted to make sure the mailman picked up before the holiday. So she kind of put them in a certain way so he would know to really pick them up. Well, she said on the return on December 26, there was no longer mail sticking out. But here's the doozy. Todd told police he could see mail sticking out of the Medina's mailbox from the street and because of this, he assumed they were out of town, and that's why he decided to commit the burglary. To me, this is not, this is not adding up that it happened on the 26th. I, I don't understand how they can still say that at this point. So as you can see, just really kind of wild and shocking new information I had never heard before. Now let's move on to section B. This is the Aponte section. It says, 
Scott's lawyers are requesting a complete copy of the MPD investigation into the exculpatory information that Aponte provided that someone had witnessed Stephen Todd committing the burglary, and they said they believe this item exists because among the 43,000 pages of discovery given to Mr. Peterson's team, there is one single entry in an MPD tip sheet documenting a call from Lieutenant Aponte on January 2nd, 2003. And this tip sheet states, received info from Sean Tenbrink, inmate. He spoke to brother Adam who said Steve Todd said Lacey witnessed him breaking in. Could not give dates or time. Aponte has further info. In his January 2nd, 2003 interview with Officer Hicks, Stephen Todd refers to a Greg as someone with whom he distributed the stolen Medina property. Post-conviction investigation has revealed that this person is Greg redacted. Now it says here to date, that is the only information the MPD has ever provided to Mr. Peterson's attorneys, trial, appellate, or habeas. Regarding MPD's investigation into the exculpatory and, if true, exonerating information Lieutenant Aponte provided to MPD concerning the timing of Lacey's disappearance and a report that she witnessed a burglary in progress across the street from her home after Peterson left for the day. The MPD failed to disclose to the defense at the time of trial any reports or documentation of its investigation into the information Lieutenant Aponte provided. The defense did not appreciate the materiality of Mr. Tembrink's information until the trial was almost over, when they learned that Sean and Adam Tenbrink lived in the airport district in Modesto, which is, by the way, less than a mile from where Lacey and Scott lived, and were associates of Stephen Todd. The defense contacted Lieutenant Aponte and he signed a statement for the defense on December 1st, 2004, documenting the steps that MPD took to investigate. This statement was signed during the penalty phase of Mr. Peterson's trial after the jury had already reached a guilty verdict without the benefit of hearing the information Lieutenant Aponte provided to the MPD. The defense then submitted Aponte's signed statement to the court documenting the steps MPD took to investigate Mr. Aponte's information, which the prosecution had failed to disclose to the defense. The defense requested the prosecution provide all materials related to the Norco investigation and moved for mistrial. The prosecution then obtained its own signed statement from Lieutenant Aponte dated March 9th, 2005, and Lieutenant Aponte's signed statement say he made two phone calls about a week apart to MPD to report information about Lacey Peterson witnessing the Medina burglary on December 24th. Lieutenant Aponte made the second phone call to MPD because he received no response from the first call. It is not clear whether the tip sheet provided to Mr. Peterson is the first or second call made by Mr. Aponte. Lieutenant Aponte's signed statements say he made a tape of the call between inmate Sean Tenbrink and his brother Adam. To date, the defense has never received any audio or transcript of this recorded conversation. Lieutenant Aponte further reported in his signed statements that an MPD detective called him to follow up on the information he provided in his calls and several steps were undertaken by MPD to investigate his report, including an unnamed MPD detective interviewing Mr. Tenbrink telephonically. However, to date, the defense has received no information explaining or reporting or documenting MPD's follow-up including no recording of the above described MPD phone interview with Mr. Tenbrink. Lieutenant Aponte reported that after the unnamed MPD detective telephonically interviewed inmate Sean Tenbrink, he asked Lieutenant Aponte to more closely monitor Sean Tenbrink. 
Lieutenant Aponte said that after Mr. Tenbrink was finished being interviewed by the MPD detective, he went back into his cell and called his mother. As directed, Lieutenant Aponte listened to Sean Tenbrink's call with his mother and heard him tell her to tell his brother, Adam, the police just interviewed him and he has to keep his mouth shut because he doesn't know who is dealing with. Again, MPD has provided no report or recording or any other information to the defense concerning or documenting the contents of the phone call between Sean Tenbrink and his mother and the defense has been provided with no information regarding what steps, if any, Lieutenant Aponte took to provide the information he gathered to the MPD as directed by the detective. Given the detective's direct request, which immediately preceded Sean Tenbrink's call to his mother, the warning to his brother, and the fact that there was a massive search underway for Lacey Peterson that was highly publicized, it is highly unlikely that Lieutenant Aponte did nothing with the information he received. However, the defense has never been provided with any information explaining or reporting or documenting this call between Mr. Tenbrink and his mother other than what the defense was able to obtain from Lieutenant Aponte almost two years later. In response to the defense request for all materials related to the Norco investigation, the prosecution provided the defense with no additional discovery. Instead, the prosecution provided the court with an unresponsive, carefully worded affidavit by MPD Detective Grogan explaining the steps he took to, quote, search MPD's files for the information defense was requesting. On its face, Detective Grogan's affidavit appeared to be thorough, but upon closer scrutiny, it's clear a more exhaustive search is needed. The discovery the defense requested 20 years ago was not then and has never since been provided to Mr. Peterson. So Scott's new LA Innocence team is not only requesting that the evidence that was collected regarding this tip, including the missing audio tapes, be provided. But they're also requesting the actual identity of the unnamed MPD detective who interviewed Sean Tenbrink come forth or admit who they were. They want to know the identity of that detective. So now Scott's team is also claiming they have a sworn declaration by a person with knowledge, attesting to the fact that Lieutenant Aponte has since stated he believes he may have videotaped the interview between Sean Tenbrink and this unnamed MPD detective while Mr. Tenbrink was in Lieutenant Aponte's office. And there's also a declaration that was written by this Sean Tenbrink guy from 2009, so after the trial, and it reads, I, Sean Tenbrink, declare the following. One. I am 30 years old and am currently in a 13-month parole violation sentence. Two, I recall a telephone conversation in January of 2003. Three, at the time I was in Norco rehabilitation on a parole violation. My brother, Adam Tenbrink, told me that he knew who robbed the house across the street from the Petersons. Four, I know all about the Petersons because Lacey's disappearance was on TV and it was basically in my neighborhood. Five, Adam said someone told him that Lacey had seen Todd rob the house. Six, I don't remember if Adam told me if Todd robbed the house with others. And he concludes this handwritten note declaring that under penalty of perjury, he believes his statements are true. Now. Honestly, this entire ordeal should scare the crap out of anyone watching this, if it's true. You're telling me that this Lieutenant Ponte is mentioned in the detective notes, but yet no detectives will admit that they met with Lieutenant Ponte and Sean, so this lieutenant is just inexplicably lying? What is going on here? This information is extremely scary. All of that said, I believe that several different lawyers for Scott have asked for this exculpatory documentation for over 20 years, and they've always hit a dead end. So 
Not sure if anything is actually going to come of this this time, but I guess we'll see. Next up is regarding the Croton watch. Scott's team is requesting a complete copy of the investigation into the Croton watch that was pawned on December 31st, 2002 by a Deanna R and a watch that was pawned on February 14th, 2003 by Anthony S. Now, when Lacey was reported missing on December 24th, 2002, Mr. Peterson told MPD officers that when he left for the morning, Lacey was wearing a wristwatch that she had just inherited from her grandmother that had diamonds around the face. On March 6, 2003, Lacey's Croton watch was still unaccounted for, so Detective Grogan had an MPD officer search pawn records for the word Croton. The officer found one pawn record. A woman had pawned a Croton watch on December 31, 2002, which was just about a week after Lacey went missing, at a pawn shop less than three miles from Scott and Lacey's home. However, no follow-up investigation reports on this pawn were provided to Mr. Peterson, and to date, Lacey's Croton watch is still unaccounted for. Mr. Peterson's trial attorney entered this pawn slip into evidence at trial on June 17, 2004. As a result, Lieutenant Mark Smith arranged for the woman who had pawned the watch, Deanna R., and her boyfriend, James B., to be interviewed in July of 2004 in Oklahoma, where they were then living, by Oklahoma law enforcement investigator Mark Saunders. Investigator Saunders recorded all four interviews. Deanna told investigator Saunders that she redeemed the original pawn and then she pawned the watch a second time on Valentine's Day of 2003, under the name Anthony, who was with her that day. Deanna told investigator Saunders that she never redeemed the second pawn because of a visit to her home by detectives in late February or early March of 2003. During this visit, Deanna gave the detectives the second pawn slip from February 14, 2003. Both Deanna and Anthony told investigator Saunders that they were visited by, quote, detectives with star-shaped badges and a private investigator for Scott Peterson. To this day, Mr. Peterson defense has never been provided with any investigation reports documenting a 2003 visit by MPD or the district attorney's office or anyone else in law enforcement carrying star-shaped badges. Deanna explained that the first visit from investigators asking questions about the pawn Croton watch occurred, quote, a week or so to 10 days before March 12, 2003. The date Deanna's home, located at Rimrock in Modesto, was raided by police. Additionally, pawn shop owner Sam N stated in a televised interview that aired in 2017 that Modesto police were looking for a Croton watch and evidently his shop popped up in the system, the only one in the last six months or so that had purchased a Croton watch. Deanna also recalled that the first visit occurred before her sister and brother-in-law Shane were involved in a high-speed police chase that resulted in Shane's death on March 11th, 2003. So yeah, it appears people close to Deanna were involved in a lot of legal activity as far as substance dealing, burglary, and then like pawning of those items. MPD continued its investigation into the pawned watch in October of 2004, when James Romano came forward with additional information, and the information he provided to the police department was regarding the abduction of Lacey Peterson. It is referenced in Bates that he spoke to the police clerk, Detective Handy, Sergeant Campbell, Duty Safford, and Deputy Johnson. And here again, we are seeing that they are asking for the identity of a confidential, reliable informant known as X that Officer Hicks used to encounter the residents at Rimrock Court and purchase the substance, M-E-T-H, from Deanna. 
is looking for all reports and statements made regarding the Croton Watch, not limited to these individuals and this James R. guy, referenced including his outgoing mail while he was incarcerated between 2003 and 2004, where he indicated to friends outside that he had information regarding the Lacey Peterson investigation. Plus, all statements this guy James made in a 2004 interview identifying someone named Coyle as having been involved in the Medina burglary. So they are also asking for booking photos of some of these individuals, including this Deanna person who pawned the watch and was apparently dealing substances. It is important to also mention in this section of the motion, it says in the footnotes that Mr. Peterson did not learn about or have any knowledge that a Croton watch was pawned at a nearby pawn shop within days of his wife's disappearance until after his arrest on April 25, 2003, when his attorneys began receiving discovery. The pawn slip with Deanna's name on it was not provided to the defense until afterwards. So. That seems like a lot of information that may be connected to the burglary. Obviously, if, you know, Lacey's wearing this watch that is inexplicably, you know, in the hands of this Deanna girl who also knows this Todd guy, that's starting to look like a little bit of a trail. On to the next section of the motion, number four. Incendiary Van Fire in Airport District, the morning of December 25th, 2002. Now, this was completely new news for me. Even though I had done a ton of research in this case, I had never heard of a van fire that occurred less than a mile from the Peterson home hours after Lacey disappeared, did you? I mean, now, from what I've read, well, it says airport district. It wasn't actually anywhere near an airport. It turns out airport district is just the name of this sort of dirt road alley that runs behind houses less than a mile from the Peterson home. It says here that Scott's lawyers are requesting a complete copy of whatever the Modesto Police Department and Modesto Fire Department have concerning the investigation of this fire of an orange van containing a mattress with apparent bloodstains located in the alley between 612 Thrasher and 607 Empire less than one mile from the Petersons' home in the early morning hours of Christmas Day 2002, which was just hours after Lacey was reported missing. Now, they are requesting all kinds of evidence with that, including the 911 call and all police reports and evidence, including forensic evidence testing that was done on the apparent bloodstains, which showed to have been human blood. Interestingly, I just saw a news report the other day of a man named Brian Spitalowski, I hope I'm saying that right, a Modesto Fire Department investigator who worked on this fire case. And he was approached by an investigative reporter and disclosed that he was always shocked by the lack of police involvement in this specific case. He says he's not sure how the evidence would change the trial, but says neither the prosecution nor defense asked for an evaluation of the van in that case. I don't have a, an agenda or an opinion on his guilt or his innocence. This is for me, it's a, uh, a fire investigation in a vehicle that has blood, possible blood, you know, um, on the mattress. And that right there is important. And check this out, there's even more witnesses or possible sightings of this van, which occurred directly before it caught fire, including a Mike C's interview with MPD reporting that he saw a quote, bright orange blazer type vehicle in East La Loma Park, which is near Dry Creek Park, where it is believed Lacey was walking Mackenzie that day, that resembled the color of a Caltrans van with suspicious looking men standing nearby. And he also saw a dog he recognized as the Peterson's dog, Mackenzie, in the park on the morning of December 24th, 2002. And perhaps one of the most chilling things I read in this section was a report called in by a woman named Patty saying that 6.30 a.m. on Christmas morning, 
she saw a rust-colored van stall outside of her street in front of her home at Highland Drive, which is about a thousand feet from the Petersons' home. But this woman didn't just see the van, though. She said that a woman came knocking on her door asking for gas, which Patty's husband then provided to this woman. So my question is, did Patty's husband provide a round gas can that was later used to pour gasoline around the inside of the van and this bloody mattress? Photos indicate that this bloody mattress inside the van was burned, except for one small circular area, which appeared to be underneath where this gas can was kind of placed and where it was left. One of the working theories is that Lacey Peterson came out of this house right here, 523 Covina, and there was a burglary in progress right across the street at 516. So we're going to make that drive to see where the van would have gone. It's about a mile away over to this alleyway where this burnt out orange van was located. This is the alley where the orange van was discovered December 25th, 2002. The van was found right here, fully engulfed in flames, about a mile away from Scott and Lacey Peterson's home. This is in a notorious, dangerous area of town. And now some wonder if evidence found inside that van could hold a critical clue to this case. So the question is, why was a van being set on fire with human blood in it? What were these people trying to erase? And whose blood is that? Was there any other missing persons that never turned up missing that day? From what I understand, there are not. And here we go, this is where it gets infinitely worse. It does say in the footnotes of this section, there is a signed declaration by a person or persons attesting to the fact that 607 Empire, where that van was found in the alley, was the address of Stephen Todd's sister-in-law, Telesia Cohen, the daughter of Cliff Cohen, whose name Todd provided as his unverified alibi for December 24th. So you're telling me this suspicious burned van with blood in it is directly behind the alibi location for one of the burglars. And it just gets weirder and weirder. Let's move on to section E. Eyewitnesses who reported seeing Lacey on or after December 24th. And here I'm just going to read off witnesses, first names only, although their full names are printed in this motion, who were mentioned in the Bates notes that the Peterson team is requesting all collected evidence from these people be turned over to their team. Colleen T., who reported to MPD on December 30th, 2002, that on 1224, between 10 and 1030, she was backing out of her driveway when she saw someone that looked like Lacey. Homer and Helen M., who reported on January 3rd, 2003, that they saw Lacey Peterson walking her dog in the Laloma neighborhood on December 24th, 2002. Tony F., who reported to MPD that on December 30th, 2002, that he saw Lacey on 12-24-2, about 10 a.m., walking the dog in a northwest direction on La Loma, near the same location where Homer and Helen reported seeing Lacey at the exact same time. It's also worth mentioning that the location where Tony, Homer, and Helen reported seeing Lacey on the Loma is the precise location where the police bloodhound scent dog named Merlin trailed Lacey's scent on December 26, 2002. There was also a Sharon P. who reported that she may have seen Lacey Peterson on the Loma just south of the bridge on Christmas Eve, not far from the same location that Homer, Helen, Tony reported seeing Lacey and where the dogs believed Lacey was walking. Rebecca J., who reported twice on December 26th and 27th that her neighbors on Covina saw the missing person walking her golden retriever west on the Loma Ave. A couple named Frank and Martha, who lived just a few houses down from the Petersons, also reported a sighting. So now we're getting into people who are actual neighbors of Lacey and Scott. 
And, and, you know, back then it was reported that they actually, like, were friends with a lot of their neighbors and they knew them by name and face. And it was reported that Lacey and Scott often talked to people as they walked down the street. Vivian M., who called MPD on January 1st, 2003, to report that on December 24th, between 10 a.m. and 10.30, she, quote, saw a lady who fits the description of Lacey, who was walking a golden retriever. There was a man named Gene P., who reported to MPD that he saw Lacey the morning of her disappearance on the west side of the park with her dog. Rachel B., who reported seeing a woman walking her dog on Wilson Avenue and was yelling at her dog to come back, come back, because the dog had gotten away from her. Mike C. was interviewed by Detective Brocini two days after the disappearance and said he saw the Peterson's dog being walked on the footpath where Covina dead ends. John B. reported on December 29th seeing a white pregnant woman walking a dog in La Loma Park the morning of December 24th. And finally, Tom H., who reported to MPD on December 28th that he had just seen a pregnant woman fitting Lacey's description who appeared to be under duress getting into a van on Scenic Road near Klaus Road. That is a lot of information, but that's just basically it. They're looking for all and any evidence the police have regarding those witnesses who stepped forward to report seeing Lacey. Now, pretty closely related to that, the next section is F, Eyewitnesses who reported seeing the Peterson's dog alone and unattended in the La Loma neighborhood of the morning of December 24th, 2002. While Lacey was still missing, the following witnesses who lived locally called MPD and reported seeing a dog fitting Mackenzie's description walking alone, unattended, in the La Loma neighborhood the morning of December 24th. And just a side note, there was a witness who took the stand pretty early on in the trial who was one of Peterson's neighbors. Her name is Karen. She testified that she was backing out of her driveway when she noticed the Peterson's dog, Mackenzie, was wandering the street with a muddy leash on. So she immediately recognized the dog to be Mackenzie. So she pulled over, she picked up Mackenzie's leash, and led into the Peterson's backyard. And she said she remembered calling out, asking if anyone was home because she found the dog, didn't hear anybody responding, so she left the dog in the yard and closed the gate. Then she actually said she had to go back into her home to wash her hands because there was so much mud that got on her hands from the leash. So I had known about at least one or two witnesses seeing Mackenzie wandering without um, anyone with her with her leash on. But I didn't hear about the rest of these following witnesses who reported seeing what was likely Mackenzie wandering alone. And these specific witnesses are what the LA Innocence Project is asking for more information or evidence on. Leora G, who reported to the MPD on January 7th, 2003, that she was a driving instructor. And on this day, she was in the Laloma neighborhood the morning of December 24th when she saw an older orange dog by itself. The dog had a leash on. On January 10th, 2003, MPD officer Hicks reported that he called Miss Garcia and spoke to her on the phone. And without showing her a photo of Mackenzie, determined over the phone that the dog could not be the same as the Peterson's dog. And this motion goes on to say that Mr. Scott Peterson has received no discovery explaining on what basis the MPD determined the dog Miss Garcia saw was not Mackenzie. Barbara B., another person, called the MPD and reported that she had seen a golden retriever with a red leash walking by itself at approximately 11.30 a.m. There was a John H. who called MPD on December 27, 2002 and reported that a couple of days ago he saw a large golden retriever running around loose in the Haddon area. The dog was not wearing a collar and he did not notice a leash. Linda S. called MPD on December 27, 2002 and reported that she was out walking her own dog two or three days prior and saw a golden retriever with a collar and tags. The dog ran away from her. There was a Victoria P. who reported to MPD officer R. Beffa that on December 25, 2002, hours after Lacey's disappearance, that she was jogging in the park on Christmas Eve between 9.30 and 10 a.m. and saw a golden-colored dog with a leash on. The dog was on the north side of Dry Creek, quote, pacing back and forth like crazy. 
Victoria was contacted again on January 1st, 2003 by an officer doing door-to-door canvas, and she again reported that she saw a large yellowish dog running loose in the park north of the Covina dead end, which is very close to the Petersons' home. Now, I'm sorry, but the, the first time I actually read the last report about Mackenzie pacing back and forth distressed, I actually cried wondering if, like, what if... I mean, this poor dog was so stressed out, something happened to its owner and it couldn't do anything about it to help. It just, I found it very upsetting. What concerns me the most is the fact that your dog came home to me. That bothers me, I mean, no question. On to the next section, section G, missing Bates pages. Now, essentially what they're talking about here is the system that is used to number pages in court. So Bates numbering or Bates stamping assigns unique identifiers to each page in a collection of documents. It's a way to index documents so they're easier to find later. So what they're saying is here, well, there's at least two Bates numbering systems used in the discovery of this case, one at the bottom and one at the top. So they're saying that it appears the Bates number on the bottom right became the controlling Bates numbers and it exceeds well over 43,000 pages, but they are still missing large chunks of pages. So they're kind of listing that out. Okay, so the next section is H, the Gene Ralston reports, videos and other data related to base searches. And I'll also cover section I here while we're here because it's very closely related. All reports, videos and other data related to base searches. Any notes, reports authored by MPD Sergeant Cloward and or correspondence between Gene Ralston and Sergeant Cloward regarding their mid-February 2003 discussion about an object captured by sonar imaging on January 24, 2003 that measured 5.3 feet in length and appeared to have two small objects on opposite ends. Now, I'm not sure what they're getting at here. Um, I do know Lacey was about five foot one, so I'm not sure if they're trying to reference what may have been her body or what. And really they're looking for any and all correspondence regarding the base search, including all the people involved in the searches. Most notable in this section, I think, is that they mention the opinion that Mr. Ralston gave the police that Lacey Peterson's body was not deposited in the location MPD and the prosecution claimed and the reasons for rejecting his opinion. Mr. Peterson has received no discovery regarding this topic. Apparently, Mr. Ralston gave an interview last year in 2023 with a journalist and stated that he communicated regularly with the MPD and still does to this day. So next up, we have Section J, that Scott Peterson's team is requesting computer forensics evidence related to time Mr. Peterson arrived at his office. Police did find that Scott's story about when he arrived to his warehouse after he left home around 10 a.m. on Christmas Eve was accurate because of his work computer had activity on it that he said he was doing. His team is saying here that their client, Mr. Peterson, has not been provided with any computer forensic reports indicating what time he turned on his work computer at his office on December 24th. So they are wanting to see more evidence in their possession on that topic. Now for Section K, scent dogs reports, including water cadaver dogs employed in base searches because dogs were indeed used in the search for Lacey. And although it is admissible, many times it's considered not all that accurate or it's considered junk science altogether and has actually been proven that it has led to many wrongful convictions. So Scott's team is asking for all evidence related to the dog searches. Now, I will say, some of the dogs did track Lacey's scent in the area where this new van was found, right? The cadaver dogs alerted at the bay also. However, the defense points out here that these dogs only had a 40% success rate and weren't fully trained properly. And it's also mentioned in this motion that they want the prosecution to hand over evidence related to specifically how witnesses observed the scent dog alerting to Lacey's scent on the West Dock 
of San Francisco Bay, rather than on the East Dock, where Mr. Peterson tied up his boat when he put the boat in the water on December 24, 2002. So in other words, the dogs weren't even alerting on the correct dock area where Scott Peterson was that day. Now, I have to point this out because it drives me a little bit nuts. After Lacey went missing, the police would go on to claim that aside from the overly calm demeanor that Scott had, overly calm, overly stoic, Scott never asked the police any questions at all in relation to their search for Lacey. They were really weirded out. He never wanted to know anything. He was never asking them how it was going, etc. However... Do you have any questions? No, I mean, I've asked you a couple times what you do, uh, so I have the answers to that. So I think we're going to go do it. That's so, what, yeah, there's, you know, all we can do now is make people aware of the problem, the situation, and hope that somebody saw something. Saw something. The only question I have about resources available to use all my mother in law tonight. You know, you saw some by my wife's friend, my you know, for uh, counseling, that kind of thing. There, so, yeah, there was. Can you give us the numbers or if I search them out? No, no, I can give you those numbers. Um, I just don't know. I mean, it, it, you're probably not going to get any answers today. Yeah, no, no, I mean, but. Yeah. It's Christmas. I mean, yeah, of course. So, well, and there's no need to qualify. Today, we find Lacey in the next days. What concerns me most is doing anything I can to further progress. I appreciate that, and I don't want you to hold. I don't want you to hold it against me. I mean, sometimes I hate asking. So you have to do it, but I, I do. I really do have to do it. And I mean, I understand. I'm glad you have a strong support system. Yeah. Um, and I'll give you my numbers and my cards, but there's not more. A lot more we can do right now with the cameras. At least one detective has come out doing public interviews, stating that one thing that made them realize that Scott was probably guilty was that he asked them, I'll repeat that again, he asked them a question about whether they were going to use dogs to help find Lacey. Okay, so are you going to use dogs to help find her? Now, and... Police claim that this question raised immediate red flags because apparently they must have assumed Scott was some kind of a dog expert and that he was purposefully referring to cadaver dogs, not bloodhounds, which are in fact used to track people alive. Honestly, it seems like the more you dig on this case, the more you see instances of these detectives either knowingly sort of twisting words around to sort of help build the case. Or maybe they just really did have tunnel vision and they were just unknowingly making all kinds of uneducated assumptions. And speaking of indiscretions in law enforcement, this leads beautifully into the next section of the motion here I'm going to go into, which this frankly caused my jaw to drop. This one gets juicy, and I cannot believe I have not heard anyone dive into this one yet. So, <clears throat> section L, MPD and SCD policies governing disclosure of conflicts of interest. So here's the new one I had never heard before. Scott's attorneys are coming after both the Modesto Police Department and the Stanislaus DA's office asking for copies of their employee policy manuals. Why, you ask? Well, in the footnote of this section of the motion, we see right here, it says that Scott's team has a, quote, sworn declaration by a person or persons attesting to the fact that several MPD and SCDA employees have reported that at the time of Mr. Peterson's trial in 2004 and 2005, it was common knowledge that Detective Craig Grogan and ODA Bergit Flatiger were involved in a romantic extramarital affair, which was witnessed by others. 
Now, if someone involved in the Peterson investigation and someone on the prosecution end were indeed having an extramarital affair during this trial, I'm sorry, that is huge. That is a huge conflict of interest. And Scott's team cited here in the footnotes, see National District Attorneys Association National Prosecution Standards, 3rd edition, 2009, 1-3.3, conflicts. The prosecutor should excuse himself or herself from any investigation, prosecution, or other matter where personal interests of the prosecutor would cause a fair-minded, objective observer to conclude that the prosecutor's neutrality, judgment, or ability to administer the law in an objective manner may be compromised. And it goes on to say in section 3.4 that each prosecutor's office should establish procedures for handling actual or potential conflicts of interest. These procedures should include, but are not limited to, a the creation of firewalls and filter teams to ensure that prosecutors with a conflict are not improperly exposed to information or improperly disclose information, and b, methods to accurately document the manner in which conflicts were handled to ensure public trust and confidence in the prosecutor's office. So again, they're asking for the prosecutor's office and the police department to provide their employee handbooks and for proof of any procedures that were followed regarding this affair. Woo! We'll see what comes of that one. Might lead to nothing, might lead to some drama. I guess we'll see. Moving on to section M, new reports and leads. So in this section, they're really just asking that the Modesto Police Department provide any new reports, leads, evidence, or tips received by MPD or any law enforcement agency since the date of Mr. Peterson's conviction identifying individuals other than Mr. Peterson as possibly involved or responsible for the disappearance and deaths of Lacey and Connor. And that's pretty much all it says. It's pretty self-explanatory. So the next section we're going to look at is section N. They're looking for all audio and video recordings of MPD interviews with and surveillance of Scott Peterson and transcripts thereof not yet provided. I know that I have personally only seen the approximate one hour police interview. I've watched it probably at least 10 times for research purposes because I like to go back and hear what he actually said um, and then piece things together. So they're looking for more to hand it over if it exists and it wasn't destroyed. They are seeking interviews done by MPD officers, including Detective Craig Rogan, conducted with Mr. Peterson on December 25th, while Mr. Peterson was at the MPD locations in various rooms, including interview rooms. And then it curiously says, please include all recordings of the pre-polygraph interview Doug Mansfeld conducted or attempted to conduct on that date. Please also provide video recordings made by cameras at the MPD lobby captured at approximately 4 to 5 p.m. on December 25, 2002, showing Lee and Jackie Peterson, those are Scott Peterson's parents, asking for their son to be released from custody. Now, we see this many times, right? Parents kind of stepping in at the police station to protect their son or daughter from saying too much. Now, by the way, a lot of people get this wrong too. They don't realize that Scott Peterson did initially agree to a polygraph. You can hear him in the very first police interrogation video. The only, just to eliminate you as a suspect, you'd be willing to take, take that. Would you be willing to take a polygraph then? They're accurate, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it's not nothing that can be used against you, but yeah, I believe they're accurate. Yeah, no, I certainly would. wouldn't be now. It'd be, you know, a day or two, a week, you think about it. No, it's just like the next step in this thing. Sure. However, he says, and this makes sense now, the next day his father talked him out of the polygraph. And it's interesting that it says here that he was kind of scheduled and did this pre-polygraph interview. So I found that to be extremely interesting. 
Scott's team is seeking even more interviews done by Chris Boyer, Craig Grogan, Alan Brocini, and others conducted with Mr. Peterson at his home prior to executing search warrants on his property on December 26, 2002, and other interviews conducted on January 3, 2003. Now, police also set up a poll camera outside the Peterson's home on December 24th. So they are seeking all of that footage there as well. Now let's move forward to section O, the Tracy tip. This is another huge part of the case that people seem to forget or maybe they never heard of. But during trial, Modesto police officer Eric Beffa testified about an anonymous tip police have received very early on in January that Lacey was being held captive in a rural area of Tracy. Betha quoted from a report about the tip, they have a pregnant woman there and he states he recognizes her to be Lacey. He doesn't want the reward money, he just wants her to be found. Betha said he and another officer responded to the area, but they were unable to find the location described by the tipster. And here is what was recorded by officers from this tip, which was given by an anonymous Hispanic male calling from a cell phone. And it says, quote, Eastbound 205 past Tracy. Take the first exit, which is at the first bridge, county area, and turn right said this was not in the populated area of town, but rather the country area. Does not know the name of the road. Go down four to five miles and you will see two white house on the left side of the road. In the front of the second house is an old fashioned white pickup. Behind the house is a van. And he explained where you can store feed for horses. They have a pregnant woman in there and he states he recognizes her to be Lacey. Caller is about two to three hours away from there and wanted to remain completely anonymous, doesn't want the reward money, just wants her found. Claims they are hurting her. Says he saw Lacey's picture on the missing persons flyer and just wants to save her. During the trial, Scott's defense lawyer Mark Garagos obviously placed special notation on the fact that a van was mentioned because even at trial several witnesses had mentioned that a man with three dark-skinned men on the same street of the petersons was there the day that lacy vanished so the officer beffa said he met with sheriff's deputy mears but they were still unable to find this location but they actually described a four day search of the area and they did come upon a compound, which was a bunch of shanties, shacks, and old abandoned trailers. Mears said that he had responded to that very location before and knew many of the people who lived there were probationers and parolees. On this call, police found the substance of Mary Jane growing, but no connection to the Peterson case. Again, we see some signs pointing to people who partake in criminal activity, selling substances, etc. Could these people, like Todd, who are committing burglaries and dealing substances and on all of these substances, saying they can't recall because they were so high, is there any connection here? That is what Peterson's new lawyers are trying to get more information on as described in this motion. Okay. So the very final section is section P um, of this motion. And it says, current evidence, property, and chain of custody logs for all evidence items. In this section, the attorneys for Scott are requesting basically all documents reflecting the status and custody of all evidence items collected in the entire case from December 24th, 2002 to today. And then this motion kind of concludes that Mr. Peterson is entitled to this discovery requested and that Mr. Peterson respectfully requests the court grant this motion and order the prosecution to conduct a thorough and sweeping search of its files to provide Mr. Peterson through his counsel, the Los Angeles Innocence Project with discovery as requested without delay. Now, whew, that is basically it. That is a summary of the motion that was just signed and filed January 16th, 2024. Now, 
all of this said, please take the time to look at the actual evidence files in this case. Don't just listen to what I'm saying or what other hosts are saying or what everyone else in mass media is saying. Actually, do your own research and then see what you truly believe about this case. This is why we have juries, because different people see things different ways. You hear two different sides of stories and then you draw your own conclusions. But with that, that's really all I have for today. And you know that I will keep you updated on this case as soon as I hear more. Of course, I will hop on here. If you appreciate what you have heard here today, please take a second to subscribe. It really helps the channel, and I'm just starting out. I would really appreciate your support. Please tune in for part two of this video where I go into even more details on the motion, specifically recent declarations signed by Susan Medina, declarations by Scott Peterson's private investigators, and a declaration by Scott Peterson himself. But thank you very much for watching and be careful out there.